Good morning, Shedders, and welcome to our webinar this morning uh, on conflict resolution for sheds. Today, we'll be looking at two items. One is the IMSA's process, when sheds find themselves with a dispute within their shed. And the second topic is conflict management. IMSA's presenter this morning is Mr. Tom Murray, a neutral experienced third party mediator whom IS, IMSA have engaged in the past with a number of sheds around the country. IMSA acknowledges that from time to time, disputes arise in sheds between members and depending on how the conflict is managed will dictate how many of the following steps your shed will need to take part in. Resolving the conflict within the shed. Obviously, this is the preferred option. It's the simplest, it's the quickest way, and very much supports the ethos of camaraderie, well-being, and good faith. IMSA resources are limited, so we ask each shed to make every effort possible to resolve the issue within their shed. The next slide, Shana. If the dispute cannot be resolved within the shed, the next step would be for the Irish Men's Sheds Association to accommodate mediation with an independent third party. To do this successfully, IMSA would need both parties to agree in partaking in the, in the mediation and both parties providing a brief synopsis of their grievance in their shed. In turn, IMSA will share only this with an independent mediator, in our case, Tom Murray. The next slide, sorry. It is important that sheds understand that staff members cannot make any decision or take either side in the dispute. All staff can do is log your calls and your emails and make sure you are offered a third party mediator. The IMSA will pay for a mediator to chair this initial meeting. Tom will now come in and explain mediation and how the process works. We hope that um, we can take all questions and answers at the end of this webinar. Thank you and welcome, Tom. Thanks, Eva, and good morning, men. Um, thank you for giving me the chance to talk to you. Just as a brief way of introduction, as Eva said, that I have worked with a few sheds um, throughout the country to help resolve some conflicts in the past. Um, I've been a mediator for too many years. Um, started off, I got into mediation on behalf of the Irish Pharmacy Union because I'm a pharmacist as well as a mediator. I did a bit of stuff on the Irish peace process. I uh, went to Harvard Law School to, to study negotiation skills in mediation and conflict resolution. And so now I do this as one of my roles. So I'm just going to talk firstly, initially about the mediation process. Um, some of you have had experience of this with me, some of you haven't. And then just a little bit about recognizing conflict, the effects of conflict and how we might try and resolve conflict. But I'm going to go back a step first, if you don't mind, and just say the potential to resolve the conflict in the shed is the best outcome for everybody because it's the outcome that means that the conflict hasn't escalated hasn't blown out of hand and some of the experience i see is if people see a bit of conflict arising in the shed very often they're a bit afraid to tackle it and they let it go and when you let it go these things often grow and fester and they get legs and somebody says something and somebody else is on their shoulder saying something else and the thing starts to to grow to grow bigger and bigger and it becomes more and more difficult to resolve not every conflict can be resolved but it's also equally important to say not every conflict should be resolved because sometimes it's out of conflict that sometimes we get the most lateral thinking and we get the new ideas and the better ideas so whilst conflict can be extremely upsetting and very emotional it's not always negative. It's never always positive. It's never always negative. It's a neutral aspect, but it does allow for growth. So we'll get on to that in a moment, in a, a small moment. So what happens in mediation is the first thing that's important for you to understand is that the mediator has to be entirely impartial and cannot take sides 
in either part of the conflict. So no matter how strongly one side might feel that they've been the aggrieved or the hard done by side and that the other side is entirely wrong, it's not the mediator's role to get sucked into either side and say, actually, you sound like you're right and the other guys are wrong. One of the things that I always find outstanding is by the time I'm called in, the differences between people and their positions and what they believe of each other can be quite incredible. And that one person will describe the other side as being the worst thing you could ever meet. And then I'll go and meet them. And they're generally really, really decent people who've got the same view of the first side. So my role initially is to maintain impartiality and neutrality, to listen to both sides and to facilitate resolution and resolutionary talks. One of the most important things I'll do is I'll ask you to frame and understand the conflict because very often when people are upset about something or emotional about something or feeling hurt about something, it's very hard for them to say what the issue actually is and there tends to be an awful lot of other issues dragged in. So the first thing we do is to try and crystallize what is the problem, what is your understanding of the problem, and then we can start having talks about how it's resolved. It's important to understand that mediation is entirely voluntary. Nobody can force you into mediation. Nobody can say, because I'm paying for the mediation, I own the mediation or I own the outcome. They do not, and I certainly wouldn't practice in that way. As far as I'm concerned, once we get into the room, the mediation as the mediation, the only people that count are the people involved in the conflict. Sometimes that's done through a shuttle mediation, sometimes done through a caucus. Depending on how bad the thing is, sometimes the shuttle means you have to have people in different rooms. The caucus is when we all get together and try and talk about things. And obviously, if you're getting towards a resolution, you should be able to get to caucus. The other thing that's important for you to understand is that the mediation and anything that you tell me within the mediation is entirely confidential. And even if the shed is referred to me by the IMSA, under no circumstances will I share any details with the IMSA of what's been discussed. And I will never report back to the IMSA other than to say, yes, we managed to resolve the conflict, and or no, we didn't. If you resolve the conflict, it will be up to the people involved in that shed to say to me how much can and cannot be disclosed with the IMSA. And I'm more than happy if that disclosure is, we resolved the conflict, that's all we're prepared to comment about. It could be, here's what we've agreed to do. You know, at, at different sheds and different organizations will agree a different level of disclosure at the end, but that is entirely owned by you, the members of the shed. I will never breach confidence because that's not my role and some of the things I get told I have to guarantee confidentiality to allow people to tell me that so the first thing would happen and this is really the bit that maybe Eve was referring to when she said the IMSA will pay for part of this is the pre-mediation and in pre-mediation what happens is I will come down and I'll meet the two parties individually and sometimes just to make that easier it can be a whole group of people and it's better if they can elect two or three spokespeople who understand what the issues are to talk on their behalf. It's really difficult to get a, an understanding of the conflict if there's 20 or 30 people in the room. So I normally meet between three and five people, to be honest with you, in a pre-mediation in a shed. And we just have a very open conversation. And it just starts with, OK, lads, tell me your story. Tell me what this is from your side of the, of the view. And I just document that and then I listen to the other side. And very, very, very rarely I say, oh, my God, I can't see any way to this to be resolved. I think I've only ever had one mediation. It was a workplace one where we couldn't get to some resolution. So after the pre-mediation, the point is I will normally say to you, look, I think there's enough here to work on. And then we'll go into proper mediation. But the proper mediation is the point of when the shed itself takes over the organization and the costings of this because obviously the IMSA is limited in just exactly how much support it can provide. Um, so in the mediation then we basically talk to each other through me is essentially what happens and I am a facilitator of the conversation. If it's 
things are so bad that you can't be in the same room, then we do what's called a shuttle and you allow me to go to the other side and share whatever information and then vice versa, I'll share back and we try and find where commonality is. That's only happened me on two or three occasions in all the mediations I've ever done. Most of my mediations we've done as a caucus, which means we're in the same room. The participants don't necessarily talk to each other because they may not be in a position to do so, but they talk to me and I ask the questions and the other side gets the chance to listen. What's important is whilst that's going on, I don't allow any interruption and I don't allow any reaction from the other side. So you can say whatever you like to me as long as it's true and the other side have to listen to it and then they get to respond. It's not a shouting match where people argue across each other. I don't allow any cross talking when I'm doing that because that just escalates things. So the point is you talk to me and to the other side through me. It's not arbitrary, so I do not make a ruling. I do not say A is right and B is wrong, therefore A wins the day. That's not my game and it's not my business. It's also not the most important thing to do because nobody likes to have a solution imposed upon them. So any solutions that are created will be created by yourselves. And any solutions that are created will be created by lateral thinking and thinking outside the box and changing how we view things. And my role is to ask the questions that facilitate that thinking that allow us to come together and find a, a, a path together. It's also not my place to judge the resolution. The resolution is none of my business and I don't own the resolution. You own the resolution. My job is to facilitate you getting to the resolution. It would never work if I came in and said, A is wrong, B is right, this is what you're going to do going forward, lads, end of story. Because that's not how it works. That's not how people, always somebody will feel like they've been hard done by, some sort of feel like they won, some sort of feel like they lost. What I do is try and bring you together and you come up with a joint solution. We can go to the next slide, please, Shona. And what I will do is I will test the solution. So I'll te pressure test the resolution. So I'll say, what happens if this scenario happens or that scenario happens? Or what happens if somebody else comes in and gets involved and starts stirring stuff? Between? Very often it'll start off in sheds. It'll be, an in it'll be a small issue between two individuals. And rather than dealing with it, They'll go off and they'll talk to somebody else on this side and somebody else on this side, and then they'll add to it. And then others will come in and things will get stirred up and stirred up and stirred up. And I might sit down with the two individuals who had the problem and they'll resolve things. But the one thing they won't have thought about is, well, how do I trust this guy if somebody else comes in and starts saying things again? So when we pressure test the resolution, it's what do we do if, the what if scenarios, how do we stop this happening? going forward. If you achieve a resolution, that resolution is binding. And if you are talking on behalf of the group, so if it's a case there's two large groups in a shed, then whoever is put forward as the spokespersons has to have the authority that whatever they agree, everybody on each of their sides will sign up to and accept the, the, the resolution and behave accordingly. What you can't have is if Tom Murray's up to represent Group A and Eva Byrne is representing Group B and we agree something and none of the group behind us agree stuff. So part of what I will do in the mediation is I'll talk to the people who are the spokespeople and I'll give them time to go back and talk to their groups. That may be that I say, OK, I'm going to come down to you again. I'm in, in Donegal, in North Donegal. So it might be that I say, OK, I'll come down to you in a few days time or in a week's time when you've talked to everyone on your side and. You've explained what's going on within the bounds of confidentiality. So any resolution is absolutely binding. I've talked a little bit about shuttle versus caucus. The one thing I will say is people, some people mistakenly think mediation is a soft process. And it's absolutely not because you've got to be entirely honest with yourself, honest with the other person. You're going to hear stuff you don't want to hear. 
you might get angry and emotional and fired up and say stuff you don't nearly want to say, maybe stuff you don't mean, maybe some stuff you do mean. It's not an easy process. Uh, and it's not a, let's sweep it under the carpet either. The one view that I do have is that conflict should never be run away from. It has to be addressed. The good parts of conflict should be retained. The poor parts of conflict should be got rid of. So in all the works of life, I've worked with people from different educational and social backgrounds and whatever. I've never found anyone who said that they thought mediation was easy, who did it right. But it is worthwhile doing. So we'll go on to the next slide, Shauna. Um, you should just be like, uh, the next one, sorry. Okay, so what's important here is that once a resolution has been, has been achieved, the issue is then deemed to be closed. So if we fix something, we agree it's fixed. We don't say, oh, it's an, an old scab on a wound over there we're going to pick later on, because that's not going to happen. Once something is resolved, it's resolved. And we have to learn to leave it in the past and not bring it up again in the future. And that's very, very difficult. It sounds easy to say, much harder to do, but it's very important to do. I believe then there's a courtesy follow-up from the Irish Men's Sheds Association from Eva or one of the volunteers. Um, the only part of that that I will refer to the sheds or to the IMSA is if I honestly think a shed has not engaged in good faith, or has tried to stop the mediation process working or the resolution process working, I do retain the right to say to IMSA, look, this particular shed hasn't engaged in this thing fully. And at that stage, I think even maybe you might come in here just on the risk of disaffiliation. Would you please for a minute? Yeah. Hi, um, yes, and I suppose um, at this stage, it will be up to the the board to um, take an overview. I mean, there's nobody going into this hoping that it can't be resolved. Um, and to date, we haven't had an issue where it couldn't be resolved. So um, we're doing this all in good faith and hoping that a resolution is met and that disaffiliation is not an option in anyone's case. But that would have to be discussed um, at a later stage. Okay, if we go to the next um, slide then, please. So what we're going to talk about this morning now for the bulk of the morning is really a shortened version of a presentation I've done to some of the men already. Um, Recognising conflict, some of the causes, the psychological behavioural impact of conflict, a model called the PIN, which helps us understand how we get to conflict resolution, a little bit around the art of using questions and reframing what people say to take out some of the emotionally charged language, take out offensive language, maybe change the way you might understand what somebody's saying. One of the crucial things that's really important is to understand that the message you send is very, very rarely the message that's delivered. What I mean by that is you might say something that you think is dead clear to you. How in the name of God can somebody be so stupid as to not understand it? And it's not about stupidity, it's whatever filter it's received through will be what is received. So what you say and what you think is very clearly said can be entirely different to the person listening. And that's why in mediation, we use reframing. And even when you're resolving things within the, the sheds, you'll be using some of these skills yourselves so that the golden aim here is that I'm never needed. And if Eva turns around to me in a year's time or two years time and says, look, Tom, we've never used you once. I'm going to delete your number from the phone. That's a great result. That's probably the best thing because it means that you guys have done everything that needs to be done at the time when it needs to be done by resolving it within the shed. So next slide, Shauna, please. 
I'll just say, uh, lads, sorry, we've had uh, some technical problems and my screen won't share. So Sean is thankfully having to share the screen to me. So when you hear me saying, next slide, it's not me being arrogant or acting like I have a secretary, it's a failure on behalf of IT. Um, so conflict affects us all in ways that we recognize and in ways that we don't recognize, in ways we're personally aware of and in ways we haven't a clue about. So it starts with us thinking, having a view that our interests, our values, what we stand for, what's important to us, what we want to get out of something is entirely incompatible with somebody else's. That then causes an emotional response like fear, sadness, more often bitterness and anger. Very often the sadness comes after a conflict, when you see the damage that's been done and friends fall out and even when things are resolved, people will always have regret and say, geez, I wish we hadn't fell out over that. But we all do. Fear, we might be afraid that we think someone's taken over the shed or trying to take it down a direction that we don't like or understand and maybe bring in people in. Right? Fear can sometimes be to actually feel physically afraid of somebody who's in the shed. Um, you would hope that nobody's behavior would be that way, but sadly, I have experienced that. So we have two choices of how we behave. We can behave negatively. We can react violently. We can react sarcastically. We can front up to the row and square up and shout and roar and say things that we may or may not agree with or may or may not regret afterwards. Or we can take a positive and constructive and conciliatory view. Next, shared, next uh, slide, please, Sean. So if we take a positive conciliatory view, we look for, we look for resolution. Um, so one of the things I said at the start, and it's important, is that don't look at conflict necessarily as something that's a bad thing. It's never a good thing, but it's not always a bad thing either, because psychologists and conflict management believe conflict to be neutral. It's neither a positive nor a negative effect on, on life in that it allows us, sometimes if conflict, if we take the conciliatory and the positive attitude to conflict resolution, the only way that can happen is if everyone changes their thinking and changes their ideas. So conflict allows us to think outside the box and to grow our ideas. If we take the negative view that we're just gonna bang our heads against each other all the time, it's an entirely negative experience. So go back to how you choose to react. You need to look at ways in which you can take the positives out of conflict to think of things in a different manner and to resolve issues. Next slide, Shona, please. And this is important. We need to stop seeing conflict as winning and losing. Those are goals for games. They're not a goal for conflict. Conflict management is about learning, growing, Cooperate, cooperating and finding commonality and common goals. If one side feels like they've been beaten or they've lost, the conflict will never be over because none of us want to feel that way. So if you're managing a conflict in a shed, you cannot turn around and say to somebody, Tom Murray is absolutely right and Eva Byrne is completely wrong and get over Eva, you're not doing that ever again. Because whatever caused the conflict in the first place, is going to fester with Eva and it's going to come back and it's also going to allow Tom Murray to act arrogantly thinking he's always right and it's going to create another conflict. So you need to remove the victor and loser out of your conflict management. Go to the next slide, Shona, please. So it's never about telling somebody they're right and people who Nobody is ever entirely right. And very rarely are people entirely wrong. One of my favorite sayings in mediation is there's always there's three sides to the truth. There's your side, there's my side, and there's the actual reality when the two of us take our filters off. So I might see the whole thing in from one, one perspective, from my prism. You'll see it that way. And the two are entirely different. 
And I always say to people, if you can imagine a balcony view, do you remember the two men in the Muppets who used to sit up in the balcony complaining about the show all the time? They're in my head every time I do a mediation. I keep thinking, what would them two old boys say sitting up there if they were looking down on the behavior in the room and what both sides are saying has caused the conflict? So resolving conflict is about acknowledging, first of all, we have differences. Let's not be afraid of the differences. We have differences. Let's get them out there, understand them. Let's appreciate the differences and see how we can do something that matches both sides' needs and interests. Next slide, please, Sean. So conflict is like an iceberg. The bit at the top is what we see. That's when somebody comes up to you, you and the volunteer in the shed and says, Tom did this, or he's after saying that, or he's after taking my tools, or he takes over the plane and he uses all the time, and I never get to use that ABC. And sometimes we, when we hear them, think, oh, for God's sake, that's so petty. And it's not, because what's actually happening is the iceberg below the water level is where the real problems are. Because that's where it might have been something that's been happening for months on end. It might be somebody who's in a particular state where they're more sensitive to something and they're not aware of that. Maybe they're upset with something at home and they've brought that into the shed. Maybe they're just not feeling great. Maybe there's loneliness and they're just a bit frustrated and angry. Maybe the other guy is doing something wrong and he's even, not even aware of it. But it's what's happening underneath that's affecting the person that creates the conflict. If you go to the next slide, please. So this is kind of a reverse of that in that the positions that we undertake are when we're at our furthest apart. So my position will be, you are wrong. And your position will be, I'm wrong. And my position will be, you did this. And your position will be, I did that. The interests, which is the I is, is our shared interest. It's our shared, what we both like to get out of things. And I've never, ever come across a shed yet where there was a conflict and somebody said, I want to destroy the shed. The common interest that everybody has is, I want the shed to flourish and do well and feel comfortable and have and grow. And that's the first point at which we start to come together. The next point we come together is when we get down to our needs. And this is where we discuss, I want to be able to come here and not be on my own at home and remember why I joined a men's shed and I want to feel safe and comfortable and in a warm environment. And I want to be able to enjoy things here and I want to be able to socialize. And that is definitely a common need that you all have. So we spread from the, I'm right, you're wrong. You did this, I did that. You did this, I, or you told me I did this, I denied I did it. We come down into something we share as an interest and we get much, much closer when we get down to what our needs actually are. And what you, when you're helping members who are falling out in the sheds, need to do is get down to listen to their positions then take them off their positions and get down to what actually is important here and then what do we actually need to do. Go to the next slide, please. So positions, demands, threats, fixed solutions, strongly held points of views, you owe me an apology, you're a bully. If you don't throw him out of the shed, I'm quitting the shed. Those kind of attitudes. And you do hear them. And they're absolutisms. But they get us nowhere. Go to the next shed, next shed, next uh, screen, please. So our interests are what we regard as important to us. So saving face. So, okay, when this is all over. I don't want to look bad. Nobody wants to look bad. Nobody wants to be the one who's seen as the aggressor in the shed. And nobody wants to see as somebody who's a coward who give in either. Let's be honest about it. So how we make each other look okay coming out of this? We all have an interest for relationships. Human beings are entirely social animals. It's one of the reasons the Irish Men's Sheds Association exists is because human beings need social contact. And one of the shared interests we all have is that we can get on with other people. We may have an interest in maintaining privacy. People in the shed might know a certain amount about the conflict. We may say, look, lads, let's just keep this between ourselves. Let's get it resolved and then we'll just move on and we're not going to go around talking about it and 
allowing gossip to grow the thing again. We all have an interest in fairness and fair work rules, fair application of the rules of the shed. We all want to feel like we've got some control, that you're not being told what to do. And I'm not being disrespectful here, but the age profile of most men in the sheds, you're at an age where you don't need to be told what to do. You know, you've lived long enough, you've achieved enough. The last thing you need is somebody telling you what to do. So that's an interest that comes out in every single conflict and feeling personally safe and secure. Go to the next slide, please, Shauna. So some of the questions that you can use to reveal somebody's interests are questions like, what is the most important thing for you in all this? What bothers you most about this situation? How does this affect you? It sounds like this matters a lot to you. Am I right in that? And what you're doing there is you're allowing people to actually say, well, I know I've said this is what's annoying me, but here actually is the real thing. And I just need to get it out there and understand it myself. So if you go to the next one, please. So our needs are, they're non-negotiable. There are basic human requirements that what we need in life to feel value as a human being. So the need for safety and security. Every single member of the shed is entitled to come into that shed and feel like they're at home like they're in a safe and secure environment amongst their friends. Not that they want to come into a shed to feel aggressed or threatened or insecure or worried that somebody's going to come up and say something to them that's deeply upsetting or that's wrong. The need to belong. As I've said, we're social animals and it's why the sheds exist. The need to be acknowledged for the things we do. And that's not about ego. That's not about somebody coming up and saying, you're fantastic at that, you know, you're brilliant. No, obviously that feels good when it happens. It's just to be acknowledged as having value. The need, and that feeds into the need that you feel you make a difference in life and that you matter. The need to be able to express yourself freely and the need for love of your friends and companionship. Um, so your needs are your most fundamental thing. And the thing that's important to remember about that is no matter how much you dislike somebody, no matter how wrong you think they are, this bit's the same for us all. And that's where you, when you're doing conflict resolution within the sheds, need to bring people down from those positions through their interests into their needs. Next slide, please, Shona. So interests are negotiable. Your needs are not negotiable because if something's a real need, like the need for safety, it's not negotiable. How it's achieved is negotiable and links in with your interests, but the actual basic needs aren't. Next slide, please. Sean. So we're going to go into a little bit now on questions and how questions have the power to help us shape relationships. They'll set the tone for how we manage conflict. And one thing I've written there, just closed questions build positions and they support division. So I'd ask you to avoid closed questions. And closed questions are very direct questions which have yes and no type answers. And when you ask people those type of questions, they tend to become emboldened in their position. And therefore, if you think back to that V of positions, interests and needs, the positions get wider apart. And then you get into a conflict that can't be resolved as easily. Next slide, please. So I used questions and you'll be using questions when you're resolving conflict within the shed to build relationships through the exchange of ideas and information, to create opportunities for parties to exchange information, concerns, interests, proposals, and perspectives. So when you ask people, how do they feel about this? One of my favorite questions to ask, and it's one of my, the least popular questions whenever I ask it is, what did you contribute to the problem? How did you cause this problem? Don't tell me what the other guy did. I already know what the other guy did because you've just spent the last two hours telling me that he's the devil on legs and he's done A, B, C, D, and E. Now tell me what you did. And people get their backs up then. They start going, well, I, I did nothing. 
But they did, of course they did, because conflict is never involving just one person. So in doing that, you're allowed to people to you get people's perspectives on what do they actually understand is going on here. And getting people to understand what part they've played in getting it themselves also helps you get them to understand what part they will play in resolving it going forward. It also getting there to the common interests and concerns. That's where you find the bit where you can start to rebuild and get people and say, well, shall we both agree that the prosperity of the shed or that some department in the shed, be it model building or woodwork or cinema night or whatever else you do in the various different sheds that have been around, that developing that is for the good of the whole shed. And once people start to accept that, you'll find you'll, you'll resolve the conflict. Not easier, but you're certainly starting down the road. Questions also allow us to bring out information that we didn't know. So I often find, and when I speak to the people who come to me who bring me into the sheds, they'll say, this is what's going on. And I'll say, okay, that's fine. And then I'll meet the two parties and I'll ask them what's going on. And it might be an entirely different story to the story that the lads who've called me in have known because they haven't explored exactly what's going on. So you need to ask questions of both sides. And please, when you're resolving conflict, don't delay and don't run away. Just go and ask people open questions and find out stuff you thought you knew but you didn't know and then clarify what you did know. And then you can add questions like, okay, how are we going to resolve this? What are you prepared to do to resolve this? Another one of my favorite questions is I give people a pen and say, if that's a magic wand, fix this and tell me what the resolution looks like. And they'll go on for ages. And when they start talking, I'll write down, okay, we've said this, 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 this. And then I'll read it back to them and say, did I really say that? And they say, yeah, you did. So that's, really, that's actually where you think the resolution comes from. And that's why asking the, the right questions allow you to develop that information and move people. Remember what you're trying to do always is move people from those positions because positions separate us down to interests and needs. If you can go to the next slide, please, Sean. So open questions leave open the possibility of getting substantial answers. No judgment implied in the question. And you must never use judgment when you hear the answer. So what brings you to this process? What brings you to mediation if I'm the one asking it? Tell me more about this. What do you think about this? What's your general view of? And I always use those and you should use this in the storytelling story stage, which is when people actually frame what the conflict is about for them and for them to understand what it is that's actually annoying them. Because very often when they come to you, they have a whole pile of stuff that they give out that's really got nothing to do with what's going on and getting them to do it. So closed questions that you've moved on there, Shauna, is yes, no responses, close down a conversation when conflict is really, really high. So sometimes I like, the only time I really ask a closed question is do we need to take a break? You know, or if things are getting so hot that people in the room feel threatened, and I've, I've been there and done that. I, I've actually done a mediation on a family once where I had to have uh, a whole hotel of a floor, a floor of a hotel taken up with three different rooms, with two different accesses, two different exits, and two different toilets because the family members couldn't meet together. So there was a lot of times when I had to use closed conversations going in between them in a shuttle then. Thank God I've never had that experience in the Irish Men's Shed Association. I hope I never will. Um, but closed questions only ever used to close something down because they tend to make things worse. Next slide, please. So reflexive questions get parties to think. So what would you like to happen so that you can feel better about this situation? What do you think will happen if the mediation fails? And that's always a good one. What do you think will happen if this process fails? So if you've got two guys in the shed and the sheds, they've kind of got two sides built around them and the shed's starting to split, you say to them, what do you actually think is going to go on here if you don't fix this? And nobody wants to admit that they might be the side that caused the shed to collapse because nobody has that as an interest. But it gets people thinking, they say, oh, well, Jesus, like if that's what's going to actually happen, I have to come to some way to find a resolution. Go to the next slide, please. 
circular question is about stimulating new thinking in the parties and to look at things from a different perspective. So how do you think Michael would view this? How do you think the other side sees this? Okay, you've told me everything about how terrible they are, how great you are. How do you actually think they think about your behavior? And it's amazing that people will at that point start to say, well, I know I'm not 100% right. You know, and then the other thing with circle question, this is about how we test things. This feels good today. How do you feel about it in six months time, in three months time? If Johnny comes in and stirs the pot again or comes in and says A, B and C about somebody, how will that help you? How are you going to get, get over that then? Um, so the, the question, if you continue this fight, how will it impact on, impact on the shed? And that's never positive. Um, some people will say things as well, the reflective questions. Is that really what you believe? Is that honestly what you believe? Because when people get emotive, they start to come out with all sorts of stuff that's not necessarily rational. Next, please. With solution-based uh, questions, so you use that as you're coming towards frame an agreement between the parties. Um, so it's, it's really about problem solving. So the first question about this, what can you do to make this better? What can you do to resolve this? What might work for you here? Is there anything else we could try? What might make this resolution work better for you? Beer et al are um, they're philosophers who and psychologists who write about conflict management. And if you get to this part of the things, you're doing uh, really well. You're asking questions that, so what can I, what can we do that satisfies what you want out of this, but also satisfies the other side? And that's really when you're getting to a great crucial point in the conflict management, because then you're actually getting the two parties to think about each other and what each other needs. And you only get to that if you're getting close to resolution because up until that point, they don't care about the other side and what the other side needs. Next slide, please. So reframing, the reason I like this is um, Bernie Mayer is probably the one of the world's leading authorities on conflicts of all descriptions, be they international, within companies, within relationships, within marriages. He's a He's just, he just studies people rowing all the time, which is a bit of a strange job. But anyway, um, what I like about what he says here, though, is that we use reframing to change how we see things. But to maintain the conflict in all its richness, but to help people look at it in a more open-minded and hopeful way. So if you go back to the start of the slide, I said... Mediation isn't always isn't an easy process. No breaking up of a row and resolving a row is easy. But it's also really, really naive and childish if we think we're going to say everybody's going to get on. Everybody's going to make friends and everybody's going to sit down in the garden and make daisy chains and smoke pipes. That's not life. And we all know that. So acknowledge the conflict is there and it exists. Don't try and sweep it under the carpet or get rid of the conflict. You allow the conflict to exist in all its richness because positive things can come out of that, but you look at it in a more open-minded and hopeful way that allows you to generate ideas for the betterment of everyone. Next slide, please, Sean. So reframing can be both contextual and content-based. It's a way for looking for the positive in someone's behavior. So, for example, they came in and took over the shed, could be they expanded the shed to others or they tried to develop the shed further. So one of the things that I do see in some of my conferences, there's always a, an initial committee that sets the shed up. And they're very passionately and rightly so about what they've done. But sometimes they can be very precious about it and they're not very open to other directions being taken or other services coming into the shed or new groups coming into the shed. And they feel a bit worried by that. Um, reframing can be used to prevent blame and to remove emotionally charged words. So things like, I'm using this tool and he's always looking over my shoulder. It makes me feel stupid as though he knows everything and I know nothing. Maybe he's trying to help you, but he just doesn't know how to ask you. 
Have you ever thought that maybe he's actually just making sure you're doing a good job? Or maybe, God forbid, he's actually learning from you. He's always putting me down in front of people. So you can maybe say to somebody, do you realize how maybe you're making somebody else feel when you act in that way? So reframing is not denying what's going on. But it's maybe trying to look at it in a different way and see if there is a positive attitude or a positive part of that behavior which you initially think is negative. Because when you find that positive part, that's when you start to move on together. Next slide, please, Sean. So we'll come to the end now and then we'll go to the uh, questions and answers because Eva told me we have 45 minutes. So we're at 48, so I apologize. I've gone over a bit much. Um, so when we deal with conflict, we have two fundamental approaches. We have a competitive or adversarial approach, and that's entirely negative. I have to win means you have to lose. Or if you win, then I've lost, and there's no way I'm losing to you because you're A, B, and C. Or he does this, and I'll do that. And When we do that, nothing can happen except that things will fall apart. Or we can have a collaborative approach. The collaborative approach, as we've talked about so far today, finding ways to share, to think outside the box, to look at things in a different way, to first of all examine ourselves. Am I really as absolutely right as I think I am? Is there anything I've done to contribute to this? I might have changed, I might have reacted differently to something in the past that would have maybe took the sting out of this. And also, is there anything I can do to help resolve it? Next slide, I think it's the last slide, is it, Sean? So the competitive, oh, two more. competitive approach is based on positions. The reason why I should win is because I'm damn well right, and that's the end of it. That's the way people will start off. It assumes that the subject of dispute is a fixed pie. So what I win, you lose. What you win, I lose. Competitive approach doesn't consider a wide range of options to resolve the dispute. It adopts aggressive strategies, power tactics. I'm physically bigger than you. I'm taller than you. I'm older than you. I'm more senior than you. I've been in this shed longer than you. I have more friends than you. We get abusive. We shout back just one. Uh, Sean. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, we don't listen to each other, we walk away from each other, we gossip about each other, we spread misinformation about each other. Triangulation with others means we go and we form our own little groups. Everybody wants their groups of allies and then everyone gets stronger when they've got a few lads around them helping them. Now you can go to the last slide, sorry, Sean, I think. So a collaborative approach focus on the interests, the needs of the parties in dispute. It looks at a wide range of alternatives. So what can either side bring to the table that will actually help this? And it's never going to be the case that everything you bring works. So you need to be able to bring lots of different things. Say, okay, well, that might work and this might work. And we put them together and we'll come over here and we'll get an agreement. It adopts a constructive approach to resolving differences. It naturally causes us to empathize with others. And that's really, really difficult to do when, quite frankly, you hate some son of a gun who's done wrong to you. If you collaborate in the resolution, you actually have to say, I feel something for him. I understand something where he's coming from. Might not like his behavior, but I can empathize with why he's got to where he is. And that's really difficult to get to. It's tolerant and it's respectful. It listens to the opposing viewpoint. And most importantly, it's willing to solve the dispute and try to a number of different approaches to do so. Is there another slide, Sean, or is that us, I think? Oh, yes, yeah, so just to really remind you that conflict is neutral. It's a primary motivator for change. Never see it as a contest about who is right or who is wrong. See conflict as acknowledging diversity. It begins within, so conflict starts here. Conflict starts with the man in the mirror. It starts there, how you felt about what somebody did and how you reacted to how somebody did. When we learn what it is that shapes our attitude to it, we learn to grow from it. 
So if I know that in particular there's somebody at work I I really struggle to get on with. We just we're never going to get on. And I used to walk in thinking, Jesus Christ, I can't believe I've got to face that person again today. And then I started saying, actually, you know, you know that old saying, hatred's a bit like you drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. And I started thinking, you know, I go in there with the negative attitude, and no matter what the poor creditors, is, I'm going to react badly to it. And even if they are wrong and they're annoying me, all I'm doing is getting annoyed about it myself. So to learn and grow from it, I make an effort every single day to be nice to that person and just to start the day off positively with them. And it's taken a while. I'm never, we're never going to be friends, but we get on really well at work now because I had to learn and grow because I had to say, no point in me teaching all these people about conflict resolution when Bucko here doesn't see it in his own mirror every morning. So, look, our natural reaction to conflict is to fight, to force, or flight is to run away, to give in, run away and just let it go, which never resolves anything. Or we can collaborate. Is there one more, Shauna? Or is that it? So, conflict is part of everyday life. We grow through conflict. There's no such thing as the right answer. There's loads of different right answers to a problem. There's no absolute right answer either. How it's defined relates to how the problem is solved. So how we view the problem will affect our ability to solve it. With practice, you become better and better at resolving conflict. And the more often you deal with conflict in the sheds, and please do not ignore it and run away from it, because you'll end up trying to solve a much bigger problem later on. The more often you do it, the better you become at it. And there's always a wide range of options available to resolve the differences from running away, avoiding everything, to knocking the head out of each other, which by the way, you're not allowed to do, of course. Um, one more, I think, Sean, isn't there? No, that's the end of it then. Okay, so Eva, do you want to come back in now and yeah. run the Q&A? Well, I don't yeah. know. Absolutely, I don't see any Q&A questions up yet, but um, I'd be really surprised maybe if someone wants to put up their hand to ask a question. I think it's very important, Tom, that, you know, everything you've spoken about this morning, we've recorded and we will be able to, you know, put up on our website and men can, you know, they'll be able to go back over it because there was quite a lot in that. But every slide was as important as the next. <laughs> That's the shortened version that I did with you before. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, it's, it's the same a, thing. The concepts are the same, yeah. Yeah, it's a very, it's a very hard subject, and I often find it, you know, um, it's very sad as well, you know, when it happens. So mm. I would reiterate: the sooner that you can deal with any situation and shed, the better. And I hope that you can understand today, as a group of sheds, that there are supports there for you and um, use them. I've worked with Tom now over the last number of years and, you know, we have resolved issues within sheds. So it has all been very positive. Mm. 